from across the globe. From the center of aerospace. And now to you. Thank you for downloading the Aero Society podcast from the Royal Aeronautical Society. Thank you for the invitation. Hopefully, um, the presentation is of interest to you. Uh, I'd probably like to start off first by asking the question, who knows anything about 3D printing or additive manufacturing? Okay, that's, that's okay. So I was concerned that I pitched the presentation in the wrong way. So um, what I've got is a presentation that will, if I cut through to the next slide, it lets me, is a bit of history about additive manufacturing. Um, really to try and put some perspective in timescales because those that generally know about it think it's a very new technology. It's not an old technology, but it's not as new as people think it is. And, um, and then really to go through some technological milestones in terms of how it's achieved, again, to give an idea in terms of where we're going. Case studies of examples that are very public in terms of the use of the technology and then a series of, of the blockers, the problems that in terms of the adoption of additive manufacturing in the aerospace industry and the way that Renishaw as a company have um, are addressing that, at least that's our view on it. I've also got in here a short clip to show through exactly who Renishaw are for those that of you who don't know. So I'm going to start with my background. So I am an apprentice trained engineer, I'm originally from Wolverhampton. Um, I finished my apprenticeship and I moved into what we called at that a particular company, our aircraft shop, which was actually making critical flight parts for um, Westland helicopters for the Sea King. So we actually uh, produced the, um, all the components that connected the gearbox to the blades. So um, all the, the, what we called the hinges, so that the blades could be wound back and, um, and put into storage so when it went on to the aircraft carriers and that. So I cut my teeth on, on the aerospace background. From then on, I'd actually finished my apprenticeship and I went into the new technology of the time, which was CNC machine tools. So we're talking End of, the, uh, end of the 70s into the early 80s. So my first job was to introduce this new up-and-coming technology into the Westland helicopter subcontract shop where the way of manufacturing had been the same for the last 25 years with no movement in there whatsoever. So there's a bit of deja vu here because in a way I've always stayed with the, the cutting edge technologies and I see a lot of the adoption issues and technological issues, although different, but the same hurdles in terms of what additive manufacturing is going through now as to what CNC was going through at that particular time. So, probably the best thing to do is go to an ASTM standard, which is the definition of what additive manufacturing is. So, I'll read it out. Additive manufacturing is the official industry standard term for all applications of the technology. It is defined as the process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data, usually layer upon layer, as opposed to subtractive manufacturing technologies like CNC machining. And there are various different definitions for that. Additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, it goes on, goes on, goes on. The video is showing the, tech to, the, the part of um, additive manufacturing that Renishaw are involved in and wh where I've been. So this is called LBPF, Laser Bed Powder Fusion. So what we have here in this particular machine, you're looking inside the work area of the machine where a laser is two-dimensionally drawing onto a bed of thin layer powder. So in this particular case, this would be actually aluminium, but it could be titanium, it could be ink canals, it can be, uh, it goes on stainless steels, meraging steels, so uh, there are restrictions. It's, it's a material, it doesn't work with every single metallic material. Some materials are very difficult. Silver, it's extremely reflective, as is copper. It can be done, but it's not natural for using light to actually manufacture. The temperature at the point of the laser is somewhere between two and 3,000 degrees C. So we are specifically melting that layer of powder. 
And then what we do is the platform drops down. The recoating mechanism, which is at the back, you're not seeing it work, but at the back there, is wiping forward and then putting another layer of fine powder. And then the process repeats. And as it repeats, a three-dimensional object is generated from that, such as these examples. So these are in a range of different materials. I'll pass them around. Um, you can look at some other ones later on. But these are literally produced in that particular manner. Does that make sense? Yeah? So my own involvement in additive manufacturing, or as it was originally called, rapid prototyping, goes back to 1994, where I was working for a, a Japanese machine tool company that worked um, and developed a machine that my responsibility was to bring it into the UK. At that time, that was a paper laminating machine. So it put a thin layer of paper down, cut a particular 2D shape, and repeated the process. But it's a laminating process. So that's back in 1994. 2002, I moved to a, a German manufacturer. This technology is very heavily uh, um, put forward through from German manufacturers. And I, I um, started and, and ran a German um, additive manufacturing company in the UK for 14 years. And then around 18 months ago, I joined Renishaw, which is a 100% British company. I'll cover a little bit more of that. So even my own um, experience in, in the industry is going back to 1994. So one of the first questions is, so you can now make things with this, but what does it relate to? Is it a digital casting? Probably the poss worst possible definition you could use in the aerospace industry. But there are some things that define a similarity there, particularly surface finish. So most of the parts that you'll see here can be probably compared most likely to investment cast in, a, in, in, in terms of a surface finish. I said before that actually the layer thickness, um, we run layer thicknesses between 20 microns, 8 tenths of a thou, up to 90 microns. The layer thickness will define very much what the surface finish is. So you could say there's a, a, an element of digital casting here. So at 20 microns, we're getting parts that are very comparable in terms of surface finish to an investment cast part. At 90 microns, you're getting something that's far more like a sand casting. And various levels between that, you could relate to it. However, the mechanical properties are quite different. They generally are substantially better than a casting. In some cases, they're equal to um, wrought materials. So again, there's a difficulty there, because where does it fit? What, what, actually, what category do you put it into as a manufacturing process? In my last job, I remember spending a whole day with a series of people at a certain aerospace company in Derby, spending all their time defining as to how they needed to categorize this so that they could assign it as a means of manufacturing within it, within their business. And it was very much focused, do we call it welding? Are we laser micro welding? Is that what we're doing? Again, not a great thing to actually use as a, as a term for manufacturing in the aerospace industry. The bottom line is, when it came round to it, it doesn't fit any of them. It's got elements of every single one, but in truth, it stands as its own unique manufacturing process. And therefore, that is probably one of the first hurdles in getting acceptance on this as an aerospace manufacturing process. So I'm going to put a bit of history behind this just to give you a real perspective as to how long it's been. If you were to look around, you'd probably get the impression um, that this was an American technology. It came out in the mid-'80s by a guy called Charles Hull, Chuck Hull in the USA, and that's the basis behind it. But if you look a bit deeper, you can see it goes a little bit further than that. So the first recorded patent is back in 1971. A French gentleman, it's a German patent, 46 years ago. And it's probably the first definition of a manufacturing process using a layer process. So this was slightly different. So what we have here 
is a laser beam and a feeder of powder that are then merged together. And the point of where they connect is then how you then three-dimensionally grow your object. But the point is it's showing a three-dimensional activity, a three-dimensional production process. Truth is, laser technology was nowhere near capable. Computer technology was nowhere near capable of what was going on here. We couldn't handle the data. And therefore, actually, this pattern, nothing really happened with it. It was registered. It was forgotten about. It disappeared. And in many ways, it disappeared for a long, long time. We then move on to some of the very early US. We're also 10 years on from there, the late 70s. And this, again, is a definition of a laser being controlled by galvanometers, so scanner technology that takes the laser beam and directs it in a two-dimensional action into a bed of powder to produce a three-dimensional object. From here, several other patterns. This is the one that's probably, if you were to look at the noise of additive manufacturing, this would be the one that you would find. 3D Systems, American company, they produced an SLA machine, stereolithography machine. This is using the same thing, but it's a resin bed where you shine a laser onto the surface of that resin powder and turn that resin solid, and then you do a post-processing. And that's very much used for the early um, rapid prototyping. It's still very active. I understand you're doing um, a Formula One um, a seminar coming up shortly. This is one of the major technologies that used in Formula One for wind tunnel models. They use ceramic filled um, uh, resins for, they just make thousands and thousands of uh, printed parts, which is the standard way that they produce most of their aerodynamic parts. What you can say about this, which is a mere 31 years ago, is that this was the first commercial use, the commercial conversion from a concept into a manufacturing process, but it's not metal. Interesting here, and I just made the point, we'll cover it in a little bit. He explained within here is the, uh, the communication process, the ability to handle data. We're back in, what, 1978, around that sort of time, and um, the capabilities of computers, I'm sure you, you know it at that time, this sounds so simple, but at that time, it was such a massive thing to do. Now, we don't even think twice about it. The first move to metallics was, again, another German, Karl Decker. He patented a process whereby, um, instead of using a resin, we now use fine powder. In that case, it was a polymer. So termed SLS, selective laser sintering, which if you use that technology, you'll know that it's still around. And it's a very, very good technology. But this is the very first time that we started dealing with fine powders as a means of actually producing a three-dimensional object. And again, a laser directed onto the bed to convert that and melt it solid. The interesting thing here and why this is up here is the fact at that time, they used a, coated poly a polymer coated metallic parts, so stainless steel balls with a polymer coating, and they were then able to produce green metallic parts that they then post sintered in an oven. And that's probably, in truth, the very first means of producing metallic parts by um, additive manufacturing. This was the first one that clarified directly metal processing. It's an elaboration. And again, we we're talking around about 31 years ago. So this one it was very important. It's just, again, just confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. We're coming to the end of this area. And then we have this particular one, which definitely defines the powder as a metal using, at that time, a CO2 laser which was the technology available at that particular time. So in that 30-year period, we have the forerunners of what we have nowadays. Probably the most significant one was this one, which was with Electrolux in Finland. 
this was a liquid phase sintering process. And now we ended up with a non-binder metallic process. It wasn't full melt at that particular time. It used a nickel bronze solution. But we now had a machine where fine powder, like you saw in my video, was put down, was recoated at, at that time, 100 microns. And then, in this case, a 250-watt CO2 laser was then directed in the way already described. And we were then melting metallic parts and producing three-dimensional metal parts. It was actually rapid tooling at that time. The material was to, uh, to be competitive with uh, machined aluminium. And, uh, and that's really how this became a commercial success. Final one in this area goes to an evolution of that, which is 21 years ago, which is with Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. And it involved EOS, but it involved several other companies Realizer, MCP, MTT. MCP, MTT is important because that's effectively where the origins of the Renishaw additive manufacturing comes from. So we have links here. The reason why I've done this is one, to say it's not an old technology, but secondly, to say actually the patents that existed are pretty well all out. So we're actually probably now at the most interesting time in the world of additive manufacturing because the technology has reached a certain maturity level, the restrictions are gone, and we are starting to see machine tool companies, for example, DMG Moriseki. They have now partnered with Realizer, and they are now selling additive manufacturing machines in this way, as you would buy your CNC machine. Mazak, all the various different machine tool companies. So it's a very, 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 very interesting time. But the main message is, it's new in relative terms, but the patents, or the core patents, are now over. Patents are one thing. One thing that impressed me when I looked at doing this was actually, there's a lot of vision in these patents because the technology at that time was totally incapable of doing what they wanted to do. You know, they may as well have been Leonardo da Vinci all those years ago coming up with an idea and thinking about directing laser beams because the technology they had at hand just wasn't capable of achieving what they wanted to do. So there's certain milestones that then bring maturity to the technology and the most prominent one from the metallic side is what's called the ytterbium fiber laser. So this particular laser achieved a higher density, uh, uh, intensity, sorry. It gave the quality of beam that was required, up until then it was not. And it gave a reliability. We were talking of around about minimum 25,000 hours of laser time here. An average CO2 laser at that time of 250 watts, if you got 2,000 hours out of it, you were doing well. So, although the patents existed, the technology to support those patents only really came in in the last 12 to 15 years. So everything that we have from now on in terms of aerospace, we're talking of a, a technology that has a maturity level of around about 12 to 15 years, which in aerospace terms is absolutely nothing. This is one of the, there are three items, three technical, uh, technological advancements that produce the maturity. Second one is the scanner technology. So we've now got the laser beam. We now need to have a technology that directs that laser beam onto the bed accurately with the correct feedback, but with other functions into it. This is our Galvo block. So this is um, what we put into our machines. This is the raw uh, additive manufactured part. So this is uh, made on our own machines, making our own machines uh, in aluminium. It's designed in such a way that it actually has internal cooling channels, because what we want to do is hold the thermal uh, control. We need to get the positioning. This has got four scanners in there, four lasers. We need to hold the accuracy, positional accuracy of them relative to each other very, very well. So we've got internal cooling that goes around and manages uh, the, the uh, thermal expansions and contractions. It also has a series of other ports, which will be important later on. But this technology and the evolution of this was the second part that was very important. And the third one was the simple computer. Back in 2002, it was amazing where we'd end up with a geometry and uh, it would take a couple of days to process the data to be able to then print it out. Now we can do it in 
sometimes minutes, hours at, 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 at a push. This part here is the plate is 250 by 250 millimeters, and the height is around about 300 millimeters. And that is a additive manufactured foam. It's a lightweight printed foam. It's not a mess, it really is. It's a, so that is all CAD data. And you can imagine the sheer amount of data that's actually in that. I can say even five years ago, the technologies would not have been capable of reading that data and taking that data in and printing it through on the machine. So when we talk about aerospace and we talk about the maturity and the use, probably explains why there are very few published case studies because your industry takes a long time to qualify anything and especially a technology that's new like this that doesn't fit into a specific category is probably even scarier. So there are three, I've chosen three, there are more, but these are three specific ones that are interesting. Probably the biggest one, GE, GE fuel nozzle. So this is a fuel nozzle that is going into the uh, Leap engine, which is launched in 2020. Um, I think it's around about 14 of these per engine, and this is injecting the fuel within the, uh, the unit itself, within the engine. What's significant about the part? Well, the qualification has been, they've spent millions and millions and millions. In fact, they bought a couple of additive manufacturing machine suppliers to actually keep this going. So that's how serious GE are about it. Um, I think they've spent about one and a half to two billion dollars on companies, equipment, facilities, they are the most serious um, aerospace company in the additive world by far. And this has a series of different channels in it. So one of the big things that stands out at the moment is the need to actually improve fuel efficiency. So by having different channels, they can switch them on and off depending upon what state the engine's running. So cruising, they can shut down different ones. And the great thing is they don't have to be straight holes anymore. They can be round and twisted so they can get the packaging better. And there's a big topic on this with regard to the anti-coking nature that occurs, but I'm not sure exactly how that applied from an additive perspective, but it's something to do with the, the design of the nozzle there. The far right one, uh, MTU, which is a German um, part manufacturer or engine manufacturer based out of um, Dachau in Munich. And they took a very, uh, very structured approach. They have a very clear plan where they want additive manufacturing to do, and they chose the most boring, almost useless part to actually qualify it. If this is just an inspection cover. There's nothing more. It's just a simple inspection cover. But what they've done is they've taken a very um, Germanic approach, and that is, let's prove it. Let's get this in place. Let's use the qualification on something that actually we can revert back to uh, other manufacturing processes. But if we can make that work and be comfortable with it, we can then be more adventurous and take a long-term approach to it. And they have very big long-term. And uh, our UK-based Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce announced last year, I think it was last year or two years ago, that they'd actually uh, produced from a, uh, an electron beam rather than laser bed manufacturing process, still powder bed, but using electron beam as the energy source rather than laser, the, the bearing housing where the, the veins are then mounted into. And this was actually run. It's more of a test than it is the production. But again, it shows that Rolls-Royce is going there. There are not that many aerospace um, products. And probably, actually, the only one that's really in production of these three is the boroscope, as we stand at the moment. This one is still a couple of years away from full production. But it will happen. So. Why? And it's very much driven by your industry. It's all about qualification, qualification, qualification. And what are the means of that qualification? So MTU, I know um, the company I was working for was the supplier into MTU at that time. The, the company brought out a new version of the, of the same machine that they'd qualified or in, in a heavy level of qualification on that part and said, well, we've designed this machine to meet the things that you've asked for. And, and MTU said, that's interesting, but we're not going to take it. We're not going to take it, because if we've got to start again and requalify, it's going to cost us 2 million euros to requalify. We'll carry on with the, let's call it the compromise machine or the previous generation machine, because if we change now, 
It's too big a deal. So that's one challenge we have because the technology is changing very fast. In the time that I've been at Renishaw, we've already brought out three new products. So product change is quite negative in terms of getting it through the aerospace industry. To be perfectly honest, reliability and repeatability. The technology, in my CNC days back in, 19, in the early 80s, uh, we were buying Cincinnati machines that were so terrible on reliability that actually these machines are fantastic, but these machines have still got some way to go to get that level of um, reliability and repeatability that exists from other manufacturing. And that's critical in terms of being able to depend upon it. The other question is, how do you inspect a part? I mean, you can use the normal die pen, um, various different CT scanning, etc. But what we've got here is effectively a manufacturing process that is voxel by voxel, a voxel being a three-dimensional pixel, because that's what we're doing. We're literally lots and lots of joined spots together, effectively. So is there a way, if we build test parts elsewhere in the bed, how can you say that because you've built it there, that your part is going to perform in the same way? It's just not possible. It's not realistic. So there's had to be some work in terms of how we can do that. And I'll cover that later on in the way that we've addressed it, or we are addressing it. Um, cost, it's a very expensive technology. I saw some parts recently for, not for aerospace, but for uh, power generation. It was a 400 millimeter machine, a 400 mil part, and that part was being sold for 138,000 pounds, one part. Fine for a prototyping because uh, the alternative ways of making it, but it would never achieve manufacturing. And that's because it's a slow technology. If we want investment cash quality surface finishes, we're going to be building in thin layers. A laser can only melt, the material reacts, the material dictates the speed that you melt it at, and the layer thickness. So it's all about energy going into a volume. And uh, if we're doing thin layers, it's slow. There are thousands of layers to build a single part, and that's time. So we have to address cost, cost per part, and productivity. Um, this one's really interesting. You, the principle sounds lovely, doesn't it? You've got this chamber, and you've got this full of powder, and you, know, you can print anything, any shape. You can use the whole volume, and it will make it. No, it doesn't work like that. There are problems, and I'll cover that a little bit later on. So an understanding of design for additive manufacturing. In some ways, its level of perceived flexibility is one of its downsides, because successes have been where that flexibility has been taken away, and it's been used as a repeating, repeating, repeating um, production tool. And the last one, I can't really do much about it, is confidentiality. There is a lot of companies... Um, that will not and do not publish out and not are prepared to, um, to, to give out details of what they're doing for the technical competitive advantage that they see from where they are. So my job within Renishaw is at the moment I'm supporting our US operations, so I spend about a third of my time in the US. Um, we have customers on the West Coast that are in the aerospace industry. I can't say any more about them than that. And that is why there is a relatively small amount of awareness. All the ones that are public are public because the companies want to be known that they're in this industry. And actually, the GE nozzle doesn't look anything like that. There is a nozzle, but it's not that. So, That's a little bit of a break. I thought it's probably worthwhile at this point to explain who Renishaw are. So, and then we'll come back to some resolving some of these issues or, or solutions in the way we see it. So, we are a metrology company uh, established back in the early 70s, or I think 1974, by two gentlemen, Sir um, David McMurtry, or professor now, and a gentleman called John Deere. Uh, believe, well, I know Sir David was working for Rolls-Royce down in Bristol, and uh, he was, uh, I think he was a junior chief engineer on Concord, the engine for Concord. And um, he, because of the uh, uh, development of that particular engine, inspection or being able to check some of the internal pipes 
the accuracy, the repeatability, there were great difficulties in doing that. And he came up and invented what's called the touch trigger probe. So we have a 95% global market share of this technology. This goes on to CMMs, coordinate measuring machines, machine tools, a vast array of technology. If you see a machine shop somewhere and you see an inspection machine, you are most likely to see a Renishaw probe and Renishaw technology. We've gone a lot further than that. We do robots for um, uh, medical. So we actually produce a robot that actually is for brain operations, deep brain. Um, it uh, inserts sensors within the brain uh, or chemicals for controlling uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, sensing lots of different things. So we've gone very diverse. We do encoders, we do uh, machine tool software, we do software interfacing all the way through. And as of seven years ago, we bought a small British company called MTT, which is a company of around about 30 people that was uh, linked with the German companies. I mentioned the patent earlier on. And uh, Renishaw bought that seven years ago. In the last seven years, it's now evolved into a division of around about 250 people, somewhere around there. It's always very difficult because we're a large company and we draw on lots of different resources. Um, and it's, I think there are now six people left from MTT in the whole business. So it's now become a, a very Renishaw product. We are in for the long game. So that's a lot of years of investment into additive manufacturing. We're finally coming to a position where our products can be um, put up as direct competitors, if not better than our competitors. And I'll, and I'll cover that a bit later on. We are um, a FTSE 250 company. We are an innovator. We're based in Wooden Under Edge, which is uh, north of Bristol, just in the South Cotswolds. Uh, but we have manufacturing in uh, South Wales. We have uh, lots of manufacturing around. We are a UK manufacturer, so we're an inventor. So Sir David is the inventor. John Deere was the expert in economic manufacturing processes. So the marriage of the two means that we have an attitude of innovation, which is still driven by Sir David, who's now in his mid to late 70s, as they, they both are, but he's still fully engaged with the business. And John Deere's approach is we make it, we control our costs, we control our quality. It's a very rare solution. In additive manufacturing, it is normal that manufacturers use subcontractors to make their machines. So as it stands at the moment, we are unique, as far as I know from my history, as the only people who are really making our own machines and therefore in control of it. It's our ethos. I think it's a bit of a leftover of the sort of 70s when manufacturing dived in the UK. So if you didn't make it yourself, there wasn't really anything left there to be doing it. And I think that mentality pretty well stayed with the company forever. And uh, it's been a core, a core ethos of the business. So I'll just jump over there. That's Sir David. Um, we patent, we invent, we innovate, we manufacture, and the vast majority of that is done here in the UK. As to the size of the company, this is just over a year out of date. 2017, so our, our year is, is July, we were 500, nearly 550 million pound turnover. Uh, we are more than 4,500 people worldwide, still remaining at 16% or around that for uh, investment into R&D and in 35 countries. So we grew by 25% in the last financial year and our profits also grew at the same rate as well. 26% on growth, 25% on profit. A year or so ago, or last, no, last year, after the autumn statement, we had... Philip Hammond arrived for a meeting with our directors on the following morning, and then an hour later, Theresa May came. And there, from what we understand, the discussion, they spent the whole day with the directors, and the basis of it is, how do we get more companies like Renishaw in the UK? Designing, innovating, and manufacturing. The third part is very key. So we are seen as being a major, um, I would say, a jewel within, within the UK. Our sites have this lovely old mill house. Sir David has his skunk works in the basement. 
where he has his own little machine shop and um, he goes and plays um, with lots of different things. Um, we used to have manufacturing. We've probably got around about 20 different sites, especially around um, Gloucestershire, but also we have some in Ireland as well. We have a little bit of a manufacturing activity in India, um, but the vast majority is, is in the UK. This facility here is our manufacturing. This is in uh, Miskin in Cardiff. So this is the old Bosch alternator factory. We have our own access off the motorway for this. Um, Bosch were massively subsidised to move to South Wales to produce alternators for the automotive industry. And after a series of time, corporate decision, they decided to shut this down and move it to Eastern Europe. It's a story that we all hear many, many times. Um, so this was left empty for a while and put it for sale. There were two options. There were two companies that bid. One company offered to buy it at a higher price but their plan was to strip it down and sell all the metal. And Renishaw put a lower bid in, but guaranteed employment. So we have our machine shop here. This is our added, added manufacturing zone here. And here we have our machine shop, and we have massive expansion in here. So this has now become one of our uh, multiple machine shops and manufacturing sites just off the motorway north of Cardiff. And you're seeing there the assembly line for some of our additive machines. One other thing that is very important, and people don't necessarily register it, most additive manufacturing companies have come from the rapid prototyping world, meaning that they are startup businesses starting out of garages and very much clever innovation, real startups, but they don't come with a manufacturing background. Renishaw has been in manufacturing for a long time, so we see additive as a manufacturing process that sits along and is integrated with other existing manufacturing processes. So one of our great strengths is we are a software developer. So our softwares that we are developing are done in such a way that they sit atop of all of this. The inspection process, the manufacturing process, the robotics and CNC inspection process. So effectively, we can produce a production line here whereby the inspection machine could be feeding data back into the additive machine or the prep station to compensate for any errors. Exactly what we already do in the CNC machine tool world. So we sit very, very different to um, pretty well everybody else in the industry. This is what our machines look like. American fridges. Um, they're effectively a computer that's running in here and what you've got is a lens, a window here, this is your build chamber, your laser is down here using a fiber to feed up to the top of the machine, and then um, I've got it in here, but we've got some uh, powder management and various other things that I'll cover a bit later on. It's a short video here showing some of the applications that we have. So this is sponsorship. We need to show what we're doing and, and how the technology is being used. This is in uh, Moto GP, and this, uh, the part you saw there is actually a, a, um, a suspension component. This is for the VAR Land Rover, um, I forgot what it's called, the America's Cup. So these are manifolds and hydraulic manifolds that are being used actually on that particular um, that boat. Uh, this is a heat exchanger, so electric energy, the ability to produce very delicate, very fine, highly efficient heat exchanges is a real opportunity. Um, and this is a demonstration. Again, this is more about uh, definitions of design for additive manufacturing. And integration of conventional. So the additive part has to generally go through a machining process. So, so, a series of questions there, I put them up earlier. What I thought I'd do, not necessarily in sequential, I thought I'd address them 
as we go along, uh, as, as they make relevance. So first one is how do you inspect a process which is generated voxel by voxel? So the biggest concern is that you miss a layer or part of a layer that's not melted. You don't see it because actually you end up with a three-dimensional full object and somewhere inside of that part is a flaw that you can't detect. That is a genuine concern from lots and lots of companies. Um, so there are a series of ways that we've been working on, and we're not the only ones, but we've come up with our own solution, to actually look into, well, two things. One is monitoring the machine. So we keep a real live action on the machine. We've got lots of sensors so that you have uh, traceability of the whole manufacturing process from oxygen levels through to gas levels, through to powder loading, through to lots and lots of sensors that you can, um, can draw on, and you have remote access to that. And the other one is what we call melt pool monitoring. So this is the ability to use sensors that look through the laser beam, and then the data is then collected on particular sensors, and those uh, signals can then be interpreted as to what is actually happening within the point of melt. So if the temperature is fluctuating, then you'll record it. If you've got porosity, you will see a spurious signal. So, if this works, this is what we call Infinium Central, which is a video just showing how we connect the machine. So this can be connected offline or on an iPad or an iPhone. You've got um, uh, real-time access to actually everything that's going on in the machine. So temperatures, pressures, powder consumption levels. So on my phone, I've actually, because I'm uh, supporting the US, I have this connected up to our office in Chicago. So it's not working at the moment because I haven't updated it. But I had a period of time where I could actually log in and see what the real-time activity was on the half a dozen machines we actually have running in our solution center in, in Chicago in this way. It's the most basic, but actually, from an aerospace perspective, it's traceability and uh, an easy means of recording it. The clever addition to that is this, what we call Infinium Spectral. Infinium is our software definition. So what we have here is what I described, um, the ability to look into the, the melt and receive data that we can analyze. We can then generate that real time into a three-dimensional object that you're seeing here, which can be overlaid on top of a CT scan. So if you're looking through this and you come across a flaw, you can then CT scan that part into the same zone where you have picked up an error here and correlate whether the part is, or the error is correct or it's not, whether there's something to be concerned about. Why that's interesting is, so far, the most technologies have been about 2D, and I said there are thousands of layers here. So if you have to inspect every layer as a 2D layer, then that's a problem. What we have here is the visibility of 3D. The melt pool, we have two. We have infrared, so the, the high end above the laser frequency. So we're receiving a certain kind of information back from the infrared signal. This is being bounced. And then also the plasma. We can actually go down to 300 nanometers, but up to, up to the point of the laser as well. So we've got an overlay of two different kinds of sensors. And again, we've got this confirmation and back-to-back, -back, different signals. And then the third thing is, is continuity of the laser. At the end of the day, the laser is the part that's doing most of the work. So if the laser's fluctuating, it will reflect itself in the melt of the part. So continual monitoring of the laser all the way through the manufacturing process, again, gives that element of confidence. It also allows us, if we see fluctuation and we see effect on the plasma or the infrared, it correlates together as well. A little bit interesting there, part of the advantage of the 3D visualization, so, so the 2D visualization means that we're looking at a 40 micron spot. It's very, very fine. So you look at the detail in 40 microns. The process 
has a self-healing function. What I mean by that is that you can print a layer and the laser, you may have a fault, you may have a small fault. When you go through the next layer, because of the penetration, you may resolve the fault that occurred on the previous layer. When you look at 2D data only, you've captured the fault layer and not the repaired layer. When you look at it from a 3D perspective, so we're looking at a voxel of around about 240 microns, you end up uh, with a better visualization of whether that repair has occurred. If it hasn't, it will demonstrate itself in a much uh, more significant error over multiple layers, and you'll see that in, in the 3D view. So it means that you've got a very quick way of actually um, judging whether you've actually achieved that or not, whether you've, whether you've got a problem or it's been self-healed. Reliability and repeatability. Um, for those that I know have had experience of this, probably the basic machine manufacturing, and we see the fact that we manufacture our machines ourselves is key, so we've got a quality control. What the manufacturing process, which we call the orange book, as you can see, orange is our color, um, that is our manufacturing rule book that applies to all our metrology equipment, our encoders. And we do encoders with, uh, uh, with an accuracy or repeatability down to seven decimal places. So we're used to very fine, high accuracy technology. The same rule book is being applied to our additive machines. And um, as of next Wednesday, I'm taking in a, a big USA company to our manufacturing site that can then have a look at the way that we're manufacturing it. And so far, in my experience is there seems to be a satisfaction that we're putting good things in place. So on the manufacturing side, we believe that we're, we're in a good state there because we're in control of our own destiny there. One of the biggest issues of the manufacturing process, we run this process under an inert, inert gas. So the, the melting process normally occurs under argon. We only use argon. It can be nitrogen. However, the chamber, and this is a visual of the chamber, you can end up with cloud pockets. Some materials produce a cloud. The laser can't fight its way through a cloud. It effectively reduces the energy. When we're checking the laser power, we're checking it above the chamber. We're not checking it at the bed itself. So there is a, a, a danger there. There's a concern that's well known. And gas flow is probably one of the most significant impacts upon quality and repeatability in terms of, especially for our aerospace manufacturing. And we have put a massive amount of effort into CFD design. So what we hear, we have a perforated, so the top of the chamber there where you see the little red dots, we've got a perforated chamber. So we're forcing gases down from the top. The laser actually penetrates through the middle at the top there. And then we've got a laminar flow running from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And we're seeing now extremely positive consistency throughout the whole build in terms of uh, test samples. So some of our earlier machines, we can see fluctuations subject to where they are within the chamber. And I have to say, that is quite normal throughout the industry. Doing the same thing with this latest machine, we've got a gas flow management that seems to be resolving that. And we, I think we've now reached a, a, a world-class um, leader in terms of this. Give you an idea, I'll, um, the pump, it's a, quite an easy way, the pump that was pumping the gases around this recirculation system on our older machine was a 400 watt. We're now using a four kilowatt pump. So, and for aluminium, which um, those parts were on, we're using about 1.2 kilowatts of energy. So we've got massive reserve. Some of the materials like raging steel, which is tool steel, is so dirty um, that unless you've got an, an absolute um, fantastic powder, uh, um, gas management system in there, you'll never be able to make a decent part in truth. And we've put a massive amount of effort. This is really significant in terms of achieving that quality that in the, uh, the industry is looking for. And the other thing is, we believe that um, managing the powder, it's like any process, it's only as good as what you put into it. You only get good stuff out if you put good stuff in. And what we do is we manage our powder and our, our uh, process here where we have a recycling or recirculating powder management system. So we actually run initially under vacuum, which is very good for pulling moisture out, for controlling the powder. And then we back purge with, uh, with argon. Uh, it makes it a very efficient system. But it means that the powder pretty well stays within the machine. And then we have a sieving unit on the machine to... 
sieving units on the machine that is both ultrasonic and mesh that then takes that. So when you, you're doing the, the melting process, there are larger particles that, sp that spring out effectively from it, like you, unfortunately, like you would have with the welding process, although I don't like using the reference to welding. Um, this is uh, our own design that actually then collects those um, particles. And at the end of the build, any powder that's collected there is then collected in an external vessel and taken away. So what we're trying to do here is to make it more and more automated, less and less dependent upon the individual, and more a machine-controlled solution. Cost per part, I mentioned some very expensive parts. So we launched um, in November a new uh, machine. We stay within this 250 by 250 mil build area. So the industry generally says 80% of all parts produced are um, possible within that 250, 250 millimeters. The industry's gone in many ways. There's a lot smaller machines on the market. There's also great big machines. There's 400 millimeter cube machines. There's machines with 800 millimeters. We've decided to stay away from that area at the moment. We want to be masters of what is the primary market and become um, the chosen product in that area and then move into other areas as we see fit. What we need to do is get the productivity much better even on these parts. Most times if we go up against machining or investment casting, the process itself will be too expensive. So we need to address that, otherwise it won't be accepted. We've done that by integrating four lasers into the same platform where a single laser would have been before. And that's the Galva block itself. This is a demonstration of a two laser machine versus a four laser machine. So quite an easy way of looking at this technology is, is cost per laser, or the cost of machine divided by the number of lasers. So if you've got a light for light comparison, in simplistic terms, our quad laser is a million dollar machine. That's around $250,000 per laser. Our single laser machine is around $700,000 with one laser. The industry standard from competitors is probably close to a million dollars for a two laser machine. So you're looking at, say, 900,000 rather than a million, so you're looking at $450,000. When you think that the laser is doing all the work and that makes the speed, it's quite a simplistic way of looking at it, but it's actually quite effective. So we've now got the most productive machine. In comparison, we've got a machine that is roughly one and a half times the price of a single laser machine with a productivity improvement in the region of three to three and a half times. So a cost effectiveness double. We're also, things like argon consumption, filter usage is unaffected. So actually, the running costs have hardly changed compared to a single machine. So it's quite a significant step. It's one of the steps that have to go forward. And the way we're doing that, very key, is what we've come up with. We're using a different scanner mechanism. We're using voice calls, which means that each laser, and those spots there define where the lasers are, are coming into the bed, they're all offset. But because we voice call, so we, we're looking for a, um, a focal point, but we're able to adjust that focal point electronically, and therefore each laser can address the whole bed, rather than having to work in its own discrete zone. And there is no problem in crossing the laser beams. It has no effect whatsoever. So we think we've come up with something that is pretty significant, and uh, productivity benefits, um, reliability, everything else that goes with it seem to be in the right direction. So, I mentioned earlier on, um, design for additive manufacturing. This is probably, this is more in terms of the customer definition, a customer's input, but it is such a critical part first presentation of God is actually this. This is a miniature version of a alternative satellite bracket. Um, if you don't mind passing that around. So, a case study showing how that works. 
That's the conventional bracket. It is substantially larger than that. We're talking about something in this region. Um, it's CNC machine from a solid block. That wouldn't be a great geometry for us to do. So one thing we're not good at is horizontal surfaces. So where we have these horizontal surfaces here, we would have to have additional supports because we can't build something that's freestanding and supported by the powder. It has to be supported by some mechanical means. So it's a lightweight, so that's quite attractive, but the geometry is not additive designed. So the part that we have there is what we would class as a additive designed alternative. It's achieving the same performance. It's quite a different geometry, it's quite a different shape, probably a little uncomfortable for traditional designers. But in terms of its functionality and its capability, there's a lot of reference to trees, to nature in additive. And there's a good synergy, synergy going there. Trees have this sort of flowing form and additive also works well with that flowing form um, rather than squares and blocks. So, but you get it right, the benefits are significant. So, 17% weight saving, big thing in aerospace. Um, it's an optimized design, strength-wise, it's a better product. But it shows the difference between what would be a conventional part and a additive part. I have also one more, which is a hydraulic block manifold. So I've got, I think I handed one, there's one flying around somewhere. This is about the worst possible thing you could do in additive manufacturing. We hate this. It's solid. That will crack to pieces if we try and make it. It will take forever. It's about the worst thing that you can do with additive manufacturing. It just doesn't make sense. But you'd be amazed how many times we get asked to make it. The part to the right is what we took as an optimized. So that is doing exactly the same function as this. That is relatively simple for additive manufacturing to make. That is almost impossible. The way that we've come to that conclusion is taking the block, if we just take away all the functionality, if we take out the channels that we want and ignore the block, so we've just got the channels, we've just got the features, we end up with these Branches, tubed branches. That's the bare minimum in terms of the functionality that we want to do. We then uh, use FEA to optimize those geometries. FEA is always a great help for additive, always. And we end up with a geometry which performs in exactly the same way but with a fraction of the material. We also run through iterations. So that was first iteration, second iteration, taking even more material out, reducing weights even further. And when you look at it, so a like-for-like -like aluminium comparison. So total volume of the solid block, 9,600 cubic centimeters compared to 4,650, and a weight reduction of 52%. One of the nice things is you can also start using materials. So aluminium obviously is nice, but it's not great on corrosion. So you can also start using stainless steels, lower cost materials, but get weight down compared to the original one. So you can start using more conventional materials with an optimized design with added strength in a way that you probably would not have used it before. This is such an important part of the additive manufacturing acceptance. Because if we don't, if, a, if a, um, an interested party doesn't engage with this kind of um, uh, way forward, we know that we're on to a loser. Sometimes it's better not even to go there. So, qualification, 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 as I put at the beginning. Those are the tools that we're starting to bring in. We've got lots more tools that we're working on. But we believe that we've got a, a manufacturing background, manufacturing mentality. 
We believe these are core to actually making this an acceptable uh, manufacturing process and will help speed up this very expensive qualification process. I mentioned confidentiality earlier on. There's not a lot we can do about that. I think the, the bottom line is when this becomes so public, it won't be interesting anymore. It'll just be normal. Um, so we just have to live with it. So I have one last slide. It's a totally different thing, but it's still additive manufacturing. So what are you doing? This is my dog. So we just recently had a new dog. He's a 12-year-old beagle. His previous owner, unfortunately, died away, died, and um, he was left in a, in a dog's trust home for a, for a month. And my wife fell in love with him when we took him home. The great thing when you take a dog from, um, from, from such a place as that, you almost get an MOT. So they come with uh, almost warranty, warranty. And in his particular case, his um, cruciate ligament has got a fault on it. So what you're seeing there is an X-ray. Yeah. Excuse my encouragement. Um, whereby the ligament has actually stretched. I'm not sure how it's actually, I don't know the full details of it, but effectively by stretching, the bone becomes dislocated and it can actually move around. So he went in literally last week for his operation and had this, you can just see it there. It's the same, fundamentally the same as what you can see on the top right there. It's called a TTA rapid. Uh, I took him in, talking to the vet, and the vet said, oh yeah, we use these parts. And he brought these loads, about 20 parts out. He said, yeah, these are 3D printed. These are 3D printed titanium um, implants that we use all the time. And the reason they use it, uh, and this is an alternative that's used, to, that's manufactured from, from um, much closer to our technology, is this boning growth. So with this uh, lattice structure, the bone, when, when this is coated with hydroxyapatite, which is an encouragement for bone growth, um, the bone becomes embedded within the metallic parts, where normally you put metallic parts into a, a human or into an animal, the, bone, the body will want to try and reject it as much as possible. So that will become an integral part of the dog's bone. And it is additive manufactured, and it is in everyday life. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Are there any questions? Several. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, uh, I got two questions actually. First of all, when do we see aircraft turbine base to be 3D printed? And secondly, how far are we to have a metal 3D printer to have it at home? Okay, I, what was the first one? Sorry, I missed what? Uh, aircraft turbine base to be 3D okay. printed. <laughs> um, I'll answer the second one first. I'm not sure we will at home. I'm not sure it'll actually get to that level. It's possible. There are there's some significant reasons why we shouldn't do it. One is fine powder is explosive. Um, I've talked to military before now where they wanted to uh, land these machines in containers close to the front line. And then you say, well, actually, do you want us to ship tubs of titanium powder or aluminium powder close to where the enemy is? Because that's fantastic bomb-making material. And, um, and then it soon, the conversation soon changes. So, so the dangers or the, the risks um, of having metallics at home, at least in this way, is probably, from a health and safety perspective, much further away. And cost. You know, the cheapest metallic machines on the market at the moment for small machines are still in £100,000 mark. Um, it may come, but I, I find it hard to believe. When in, at least in, in my lifetime, I think it'll be a long way. But I can see workshops where you can actually have printed parts. And I, I made a part, I got contacted from the Royal College of Art in my last job for a gentleman who broke a, um, he borrowed a 1931 AJS motorbike, a TT racer. And there were only six made, it was called a H10, I think he said. And um, the external rocker on it snapped when he took it for a test ride up the road. And he, he, um, he asked the Royal College of Arts whether they could actually make him another one. What he did, he took the parts, 
He uh, blue tapped them together, had them scanned at the local college, supplied the CAD data through to the RCA. They did some more work and then asked us to build it. And I had it built. And to be honest, as a one-off part, it was a very effective way. As long as the other elements, the, the, the CAD capability, the scanning capability within colleges or within homes um, becomes greater and greater and more normal, then I think the ability to go and have a workshop print you a casting, because the beauty of this, it looked like a casting. The great thing is it was 80 years old, and with the right scanning, all the history of those 80 years would remain within the geometry. There's no other manufacturing process. If it was CNC machined, it would have looked awful, this nice new shiny part on it. So there is a place for that, and that will come. Turbine blades. There is some work. I mean, um, GE, um, Avio in Italy have been doing... Um, titanium alumini blades, so it, it is there, but there is always that case with the reservations about it, whether it makes sense to start with that level of the technology. I would say where the biggest interest in aerospace is, is the ability to produce materials that are currently very difficult to produce, so CM247, MAR247, those super high temperature nickel alloys, they're still not possible by this technology, but there's a lot of work going on to be able to do it because the alternative ways of doing it are, are equally as difficult. And that would give really great possibilities. Um, so. Can I answer that question from a different perspective? Yeah. Um, my name's Pete Fryer. I used to be the, um, the additive specialist at BA systems at Wharton. Error. Never ask the question, when can we have? It isn't about that. It, can I get you to go two slides back? <clears throat> the order there is somebody's view. My view is that the one second to bottom should be at the top. That's our biggest blocker. Until people realize that this is different, that it makes things differently, that it makes different things, you'll never get ahead. You'll never get good examples. You've got to start with the idea, what is this good for? What can I do with it? <laughs> Rather than saying, can I make a cubic manifold? No, you don't want to do that. Can I make, um, <clears throat> well, I could go on forever. Could I make a turbine blade? That's not the point of it. The point is to understand what is this good at doing to have designers who have thought about it, who have been educated. Um, when, when I came into this field, <clears throat> I went around, and one of the chaps that taught me <clears throat> was a chap who, who liked bicycles. And the first thing he did is he looked at all the parts of his bicycle and he had a go at making them. And he then decided, well, I wouldn't do this. I'd go back to the way it was done. The first and most important blocker is understand what the system does and then make things that the system is good at. Don't start by asking the question, when can I have a cubic manifold? When can I have a turbine blade? Concentrate on the things that this is good at. Right, thank you. Um, so I've got, got two questions, uh, very different. Um, first one is, is when you look at the materials on a crystallographic level, um, how can you be sure that um, you know, the crystallographic structure is suitable for the application you're needing it for? Um, for example, they can, you know, they can make single crystal turbine blades now. Um, where's, where is it going with 3D printing uh, in understanding that? Um, and the other one is, from an airline and aviation point of view, um, is there going to be, can you foresee a future where printing machines become the norm for helping to recover aircraft from minor damage? So... Um, 
I think on the, on the material side, uh, your comments are very valid there because actually this process is a case of rapid heat up and very rapid cool downs. So there is, um, the micrograin structure is quite different to what you would have from other manufacturing processes. To some people that's a real advantage, not necessarily great on fatigue benefits. But uh, the process itself requires heat treatment and it's the combination again, we use the term additives not an island. It is a part, and post-heat treatment is an essential part to turn that part into what you want. The melt pool monitoring is key as far as we can see, and we see it as the only way that we can physically look into the build to see the consistency. That's what we're looking for. We don't even know, it's brand new. I mean, we don't even know what those signals are really telling us at the moment. That's the work. The technology has only just reached a level that we can start working on it now. Um, but the idea there is that we can at least look at, uh, at a pixel voxel position to actually see what we're getting or what a consistency. But heat treatment is key in terms of what's going on. In terms of repair, the thought of, uh, crikey, years ago, I remember a gentleman we both know, Dan John, saying, when are you going to build machines that can print 40 meter wings? Um, hard to imagine. Repair is already there. We're seeing some examples, uh, uh, not so much in aircraft, but Siemens um, land-based power generation. They actually got a standard manufacturing process where they, they mill off uh, the head of a burner on their um, a Hastelloy X burner. They, they mill the top off and then grow a replacement feature on top of it. So we're seeing already repair going on. But there's no reason why not. It's just whether it makes sense and how big. One of the biggest challenges, at least with powder bed, we do the 250. Part of the reason why we do the 250 by 250 millimeters, when you look at, say, the next size up, which is a 400 millimeter cube, you start talking of tons of powder moving around, fine powder. It's exponential. It's amazing. You go from a 250 to 400, and the costs, you start needing forklift trucks instead of hand trucks. You need powder being delivered by the ton. And it's still, and we're gas atomizing powder to a very fine level, it's still an expensive um, manufacturing process. So it depends where you want to go with that. But why not? I mean, I have to say, as I say, I spend a lot of time in America and they just talk like this all the time, it's gonna happen. Um, let's see. Hi, um, I'm working with Peter actually, but a different, totally different department. Um, one of the things that I've seen from my side is I think that the hurdles to jump, there's, a no, there's not a lot, great deal of confidence of what it will happen in, in, say, 20 or 30 years' time. So I think that's a, a nervousness that engineers have. And also I think one of the big issues that the industry needs to look at is the young engineers are really keen for this technology. But a lot of the older engineers and engine, older people, we're nervous of this technology. So I think in the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be a sway of confidence coming into this new technology that we currently haven't got. Um, and I'm looking forward to that because I have to scrap an awful lot of tonnage of metal. So it's, I think it's going to be good. But I think the, the new engineers are going to be confident to take those steps. I think also in that, uh, that there's nothing uh, like proof and time. And by the time that the young engineers take over, there will be increasing amounts of data. We're a data collecting world now. And the more confidence and confidence comes from, it works. And there are records and documentation and support that does. I, I'm finding the, um, as I say, I spend a reasonable amount of time over in, in the California region. and. Uh, the rocket industry there is just going crazy over there. They, they, and I think it's partly because their level of regulation is, is a little bit low. I mean, they're still going through NASA, but it's, it's still a little different. But those places are full of young people. You know, I really feel old when I go there. Um, but they are really driving forward the use of effectively disposable engines in many cases, although they are looking at, at recycling and reuse of them. But you look at the loads. You just look on YouTube at 3D printed engines for the rocket industry and the amount of data that's going to come through from that is SpaceX. SpaceX is probably the most prominent. It's not one that we're, um, that we're uh, a party, a partner with, not at the moment. And their engines that they launch, and there's so much publicity with Elon Musk, 
are printed. The substantial parts of it. I've been there, I've seen what they do, and they are making a lot of parts by this process. Ten years down the road, there's a lot of information there, assuming nothing goes wrong. If it goes wrong, then we use what engineers do. They investigate at the right level, understand why a problem occurred, whether it's fundamental to the process or, like with other manufacturing processes, was it an error occurred or an overlook that occurred during that process. But I think it's, it, it's not going away. The fact that it's, it's at my vets, my local vets up in Broadway in, in Worcestershire, without me even realising it, and the vets you know, making good noises about it, just shows how one of, one of our big things, we print teeth. If you have a crown or a partial dental, there's a very good chance it's printed. You probably didn't even know that. I think it's around six million copings, which are the, the raw metallic part of a crown, printed every year and have been for the last 10 years. You're using it more than likely. It's already in a proportion of you. The, how are the powders produced and how are their properties specified? So um, we get mill certificates. So it's very much about the, the raw material that's put through the process. But we use a gas or, or the manufacturers use a gas atomizing process. I think this is one area that's going to be very good at the moment. Um, the powder manufacturers see this as a great new opportunity. One slide I didn't show here is the growth predictions of additive manufacturing. And if you look at the growth over the, well, we're talking of an industry that's growing predictively at 30% a year. And that's predicted, there isn't sort of an end date when that prediction will stop. That's just the way it's seen. So we're finding the, the, the big powder companies, the GKNs, the uh, carpenters, um, the various companies like that, Oilican, are now getting much more interested in this and they're actually using machines themselves to actually use their own powders, but they're interested in the supply chain. So they're used to qualification for other manufacturing, titanium powders, for example. And therefore, what you're getting is a qualified powder with uh, all the chemicals, the percentages, in the way that you would get a qualified billet, for example. Now, there are, there are unscrupulous companies out there, um, so, again, you have to follow the same rules that would exist from, you know, approved suppliers uh, in the way that you would normally do it. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, mechanical properties of material produced by this process can be considerably higher than that of castings. Uh, and I'm interested to know whether that relates to the as-formed uh, material which is rapidly solidified effectively or whether it's after heat treatment which you've just mentioned. And if it's after heat treatment, is, um, what do you attribute that improvement to? And also what data is available? Uh, so uh, we, we supply material data sheets with our parameters. So the parameters which are the scan, speeds, energies, directions, all that, are very influential. It's the equivalent of a CNC program, but much more because it's effectively your, um, we've got a furnace going on there. We're actually, you know, we are melting our material there. Um, the properties as built are massively influenced by the micrograin structure we were just talking about. We produce, you, you've got a spot size of around um, 70 microns. You've got a layer thickness of 20 microns and you're scanning it, on a could be up to a meter, can be more than that. So you've got a very small amount of powder that you are turning very quickly into melt, two to 3,000 degrees, but as soon as the laser moves away, you've got a rapid cool down, microseconds. And that generates a performance. So, and each material is different. So for example, um, most materials will be, let me get this right, they will be weaker in the z-axis, that you'll get a different performance in the z-axis than you would on, on the xy. That can be completely corrected through heat treatment, post-heat treatment. That's why heat treatment is so important. Titanium, as, a, as built, is almost like a pseudo-columnar uh, production. So you end up with a weaker xy and a stronger z, because you end up with these connector, interconnecting vertical reaction. And the biggest downside for the micrograin structure is generally on fatigue. It has a big effect. So actually, it's in a way, the heat treatment is critical in terms of the performance that you want. 
So Formula One, roll hoops, it's a load cell, but it's under no fatigue whatsoever by having the maximum properties and actually the uh, UTS on a titanium part of this process off build is likely to be higher than um, wrought. Its elongation at break will be lower, potentially because of oxygen pickup there. But in that application, which has no fatigue requirement whatsoever, absolutely fine. Then you look at fatigue applications and the heat treatment that you do that will then convert it into a more conventional material is the way that you go down it. Any, anyone else? No? Oh. Just the the physical parts. So again, almost every part that you would manufacture, you go through a post-heat treatment process. So the heat treatment will change it and convert it into a much more conventional grain structure. So you should, and you will get, uh, with the right heat treatment, results and performance that you would get from other manufacturing processes, a more conventional process. Generally, we are above cast and potentially below wrought on most properties, but it will fit into that particular area but not off machine. It has to go through an additional heat treatment process in most cases to be able to achieve that. But we have high residual stresses. One of the downsides of this pinpointing uh, uh, and melting is that you end up with very high residual stresses, which is why we, we effectively fix everything to a platform, so we're holding it down. So we need to put it through a stress relieving process as a bare minimum, uh, unless it's very small parts like dental copings. So we're fighting with, uh, with that as a manufacturing, which is why, part of the reason why, the design for additive manufacturing is a critical consideration. But the materials can and will perform at the levels you would expect from other manufacturing processes. It's packaging. So I think w w there's generally, we believe in that 250 by 250 mil platform, four lasers with the added peripheral equipment like the process monitoring. That's about as tight as we can possibly get it with the current mechanisms uh, of manufacturing. And there's no reason why those modules couldn't be. So you could imagine having a, a 600 by 600 machine with 16 lasers. I mean, that's feasible. It's, it's not um, in, in our action at the moment but in many ways we've started the action to do it. One thing that's important, we're the only people that are offering a 250 by 250 machine with four lasers working within the same area. I think that's important. One of the patents that we have, I mentioned that was a key thing within Renishaw, is that uh, we are in the process, we've patented, we're now working on actually making it real, where we can actually, um, each layer, we can pinpoint a laser, and we can bring another laser in to actually make contact with the area where the laser is. So we know where the one laser is, hence because we've got digital controllers, we've got our own encoders in there, so we actually know exactly the position of it. And when the laser comes in contact with the other laser, we can take a signal back, and we are able to then recalibrate each laser to each laser per layer within milliseconds. Now, we can't do that at the moment, we, we have the patents on it, and we're working on the process of doing it. But when you start talking about bigger platforms with multi-multi lasers, that's going to be essential. Last question. So we've spoken about um, the post-heat treatment and the residual stresses that you get after the build-up. What, sort of, what sort of distortion do you get during the post-heat treatment, um, if any, and does that have an effect on the complexity and intricacy of the parts that you can produce? 
in, with regard to um, dimensional stability during yes, the process. it definitely does. So geometries themselves, again, this is part of the DFAM, uh, design for additive manufacturing. The geometry itself, the stresses, depending on materials, each material, titanium, for example, is extremely high, meraging steel is relatively low. Um, they will deform the parts accordingly. What we all have in, in the industry a tendency to do is know that we're going to get that uh, stress within the part and we support it, we actually bond it to the plate that we're building on. We always build on a plate so that we are holding it in position during the manufacturing process so that when we put it through the heat treatment and we de-stress it, that the part is within um, the accuracy that we're after. There's a lot of work in trying to reduce those stresses. So um, there's a couple of things that stand out. One of the three machines I demonstrated there is actually a, uh, has a bed, heated bed temperature of just under 500 degrees. So some materials, especially uh, high carbon steels or medium carbon steels, we're seeing some benefit in terms of the residual stresses. In a cold bed machine or, or standard machines, 200 degrees, those parts won't build. With a 500 degree bed, um, we're building them and they're building successfully. So there's a lot of work going on in that area. The other technical thing that is historical but seems to have benefit is that we control our laser different from all other manufacturers or virtually all other manufacturers. Most lasers are continuous laser, so they've just got a, a continual beam. Uh, we're modulating our laser. We're effectively turning it on and off on a continuous pulsing effect. And we're seeing some positive signs in terms of residual stress benefits there. Um, and we're also seeing benefits in materials that are difficult to process from other, other ways. The downside is it's slightly slower because you've got this, this action, but uh, that's compensated for the technical benefits. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. From across the globe, from the center of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading from the Royal Aeronautical Society. If you enjoyed this content, please consider showing your support for the Society. Share a link to this presentation by email or on your favorite social networks. If you have an interest in aerospace, consider the professional and personal benefits of membership. Visit www.aerosociety.com.